So now we'll discuss QQ plots, which are a simple statistical visualization uh, technique for identifying problems associated with your GWAS study. And so when you typically do a genome wide association study, you don't typically, because it's genome wide, you don't typically perform just a single uh, association test of one SNP versus a particular phenotype. You're typically testing a large panel of markers. So typically in human studies, for example, you might test anywhere between 600,000 and say 5 million SNPs across the genome. And so what a QQ plot tries to, tries to tell you is, it tries to answer the question across all of the you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of SNPs that I test, how much signal do I see? How many, approximately how many genetic variants uh, do I see as being associated uh, you know, across all the SNPs that I test? And so we talked previously about some of the problems of, of um, performing multiple hypothesis testing, uh, testing assays. And so part of the problem there is we said, well, the more uh, tests you perform, the more likely that you're going to see a small p-value by chance. And so QQplot is basically just another way of kind of visualizing um, how many essentially false positives or false negatives might you see in your uh, across all the SNPs that you test. And so suppose that we have the following scenario where we assume that we perform, say, 100 association tests between, say, 100 SNPs uh, that are uncorrelated or unlinked. Uh, if there was actually no... Um, if there was actually no signal, there was, suppose this trait that we're looking at has no heritability. So genetics does not explain any of the variation in the phenotypes. Then how many p-values would you expect to see that is 0 0.01 or smaller? So I want you to think about that. Um, and then we'll talk about it on the next few slides. So the answer to the question on the previous slide uh, as to how many p-values would you expect to see less than 0.01 if you performed 100 independent tests in which the null hypothesis is true in every single one of them is you'd expect to see one test with p-value less than 0.01. Similarly, you'd expect to see five p-values less than or equal to 0.05 and so on and so on. And so what that essentially means is that if you drew a histogram of the p-values that you saw from all of your tests under such a scenario where the null hypothesis is true in all of them, then you'd expect to see the uniform distribution. And so what the QQ plot is essentially is it's a scatter plot that gives you a visual indication as to how close uh, your distribution of p-values is to the uniform distribution. And so here on this slide, I'm showing you in the middle of the slide, I'm showing you uh, an example of an actual p-value distribution that you might get if the null hypothesis is always true and you did 100 independent tests. And the left is what you should see in theory. And so obviously, because of stochasticity, you're, even when the p-value distribution should look about uniform, it never actually does in practice. And so when you draw a QQ plot, essentially it's comparing the distribution in the middle versus the distribution on the left, and it shows you how similar they look. And so the way a QQ plot works is that essentially it, what you do is you take the set of p-values that you computed over your, in this case, 100 tests, and you sort them from smallest to largest. And so that's what the table on the top of the slide does. So under the row labeled as hours, you can see the actual p-values that I got from doing this random simulation, and they're sorted from smallest to largest. And so what you can also do is that, again, you can calculate what p-values you would have expected to see <clears throat> in theory by chance. And so again, because if you do 100 tests uh, and there, if the null hypothesis is true in all of them, then you'd expect one p-value that is less than or equal to 
2, that is less than or equal to 0 0.02, and so on and so on. And so your expected p-values from this simulation are really just 0 0.01, 0 0.02, 0 0.03, so on, all the way to 1.0. And so a QQ plot is essentially just a scatter plot where the x-axis is uh, are the p-values that you expected to see in theory, and the y-axis are the p-values that you actually saw in your study. And so essentially what you're doing is you're taking the 2D table that I'm showing on the top of the slide, and you're just drawing a scatter plot where here, instead of just simply a scatter plot, I'm drawing a line that connects all of the scatter plot points. And you can basically see that in this case where you actually drew 100, you did 100 association tests, and the null hypothesis is true in all of them, basically the line that you get on this QQ plot is very close to the diagonal. You can see the red line kind of hugs the black line. And so that this is what a QQ plot looks like when your study essentially yields no signal at all. And so in contrast, suppose that you perform a study where the null hypothesis actually gets rejected for half of the tests. Right, and so here again, uh, I'm showing you the, a p-value histogram uh, or distribution on the left that corresponds to a case where all of the tests that you perform uh, are ones in which the null hypothesis is true for all of them. And in the middle is basically the distribution of p-values that you would get if half of your tests uh, are ones in which the null hypothesis uh, are rejected. And so you can see just looking at the distribution of p-values in the middle versus the left, you can see there's a strong kind of over-representation of small p-values uh, close to zero uh, that basically give you an indication that the null hypothesis was rejected in a bunch of cases. And so if you look on the QQ plot shown on the right, the red line basically corresponds to the case where the null hypothesis is true for all the tests. And again, just like the previous slide, you can see that the red line hugs the diagonal very closely. On the other hand, the blue line corresponds to the QQ plot for the uh, what I've labeled as study two, which is the p-value distribution in the middle. And you can see that the blue line is uh, deviates pretty strongly away from the diagonal. And so that kind of gives you a visual indication that uh, your, uh, your association tests are skewed towards rejecting uh, the null hypothesis pretty frequently. And so again, the, the goal of the QQ plot is really just to give you a visual indication as to how often have you been overall rejecting the null hypothesis compared to what you would expect if the null hypothesis was not rejected in all of the cases. And so the general idea of a QQ plot is that um, when you have a lot of confounding errors, like if you have um, a lot of family structure or um, uncorrected confounding variables like ethnicity that we'll talk about in a second, then you'll tend to see a lot of enrichment. You'll tend to see a lot of really small p-values. In other words, you'll, you'll end up rejecting the null hypothesis much more frequently than you would expect. And so you're your QQ plot will deviate very strongly from the diagonal. And so the QQ plot is, is the most basic kind of plot that people use to diagnose their genetic association studies uh, because for the most part, for most traits, you don't really expect, you wouldn't really expect, for example, like half the SNPs that you test to be associated with any given complex trait. Uh, most of the time you might expect, and we observe in practice, that for most complex traits, you might only see, say, like 10 to a few hundred uh, genes as being, or SNPs, uh, as being associated with a particular complex trait. And so when you see strong deviation from the diagonal, you basically know that something's wrong. Uh, one of the problems with looking at QQ plots and one of their criticisms is that you might ask the question then, well, if I'm performing an association study, whether that's on a complex trait or, you know, complex molecular phenotype like gene expression, you might, you might ask the question, well, I'm, I'm doing this genetic association study because I don't know how many SNPs or which SNPs are associated with my trait or phenotype. And so um, how do I know that maybe the diagonal, maybe the QQ plot should be really far away from the line because, you know, maybe there are just like thousands and thousands of SNPs that do drive variation in the phenotype that I'm looking at. 
And so the question of, you know, the important question to ask here, which is that how many significant SNPs do I expect to see for a trait ahead of time, you know, before I actually see the data? Uh, the answer is that it kind of depends on the genetic architecture of the underlying trait. Um, and again, you know, because you're typically doing an association study to figure out what that genetic architecture is, this is a hard question to ask. But people have asked this kind of question for many different traits over many different years. And there are a few um, general conclusions that people have come to. So in the first kind of model, what I'm labeling here is the CDCV model. So CDV, CDCV stands for the Common Disease Common Variant Model. So this is one of the first models that were kind of proposed um, for many complex traits and diseases. And so under this model, the general expectation is that there's a small number of essentially moderate effect loci that produce very strong association signals. And the idea is that each one of these moderate effect loci actually explain a, a significant proportion of the variance of your phenotype. And so in these plots, the y-axis represents essentially the percentage of variance that a particular variant explains for a phenotype. And the x-axis just represents hypothetical chromosome position of that uh, SNP. And so you can see in the CDCV plot that basically there's a few SNPs that really stand out in that there's a few SNPs that really explain like three, four percent of the variance in your phenotype, which is which is actually really huge. Um, and so this model actually, even though it was one of the first ones that were proposed and that was what people were thinking that they would see for a lot of complex traits, it turns out that that model is has been refuted for quite some time now. Um, because people have found that there's a lot of so-called missing heritability based on these models. And so at the end of this lecture, we'll briefly mention what missing heritability means in the context of these association tests. And so in the second model, what I've labeled here in the bottom left is the rare allele model. Um, in the rare allele model, the idea is that the causal variance for given phenotypes, so those are the variants that are uh, colored in yellow, uh, and there's very few of them. The idea is that causal variants themselves may individually have very large effect size, but the idea is that for any given, say, common disease, uh, each individual that has a particular disease might have a different rare variant, right? And so you, even though you might have a collection of homogeneous looking type two diabetes patients, um, that you might think, okay, there might be some common variant that is explaining all of their um, disease incidences. Under this model, the idea is that actually each person might have their own rare allele uh, that although they in these rare alleles individually are you know strong drivers of the type 2 diabetes phenotype it's a different rare allele in each person and so uh, when you're doing these association studies they kind of rely on population level analyses um, their each rare variants individual ability to explain an entire population's instance of type 2 diabetes is relatively low and so the idea on the, the rare allele model is that these genome-wide association studies will not kind of um, put a lot of emphasis or will not be able to reveal these yellow dots because they'll kind of get lost in the sea of other variants. And you'll notice that the y-axis in the uh, rare allele model figure is uh, much smaller than the y-axis in the CDCB model, for example. And so this is to reflect that variants in the rare allele model across the whole population don't look like they explain much proportion of the variance in your phenotype. So in the third kind of model, uh, which is shown in the top right, uh, the, this is called the infinitesimal model. And so in the infinitesimal model, the idea is that there are like a ton of common variants that all collectively uh, explain uh, some proportion of the variance uh, of your complex phenotype. And in this case, the idea is that uh, in this model, you might actually see some small peaks that correspond to small effects of some common variants. Um, and so the infinitesimal model kind of in conceptually looks similar to a rare allele model. The main difference is that you see those little peaks and those little peaks arise because there, the idea is that there are some common variants that still provide some measurable amount of explanation of the uh, variants of the phenotype, um, and they are shared across potentially multiple individuals with the same, for example, disease. Uh, the final model, which 
uh, we won't spend a lot of time talking about uh, is called the broad sense heritability model. And under the broad sense heritability model, the idea is that there's a lot of um, the effect of a lot of alleles kind of depend on the environment in which individuals are found. And so the idea is that if you're studying the you know incidence of a trait or disease in a population of, indiv of individuals, uh, certain subsets of individuals in this large population might exist under different environments. And so certain alleles under certain environments might tend to cause you know, higher incidence in one disease, in a disease, uh, for example. And so because you have this mixture of people living in different environments, and there's this complex G by E interaction where some alleles only have an effect in certain environments, um, then you'll, you'll basically get a uh, kind of a washing out of signal in the sense that there'll be lots of variants that only conditionally affect uh, a phenotype. And so because you know, that's only, uh, there's variants that only affect a subset of, in, of individuals, then their essentially proportion of variants explained for a phenotype is going to be lower than, than you might hope it would be.